Welcome to this week's IG Live. Today I'm going to be talking to one of our members, and that is the Reverend Vicki Garlic, Garlic, and she is going to be talking to us about introducing world religions to kids. Now, some of you may remember that uh, Vicki and I actually spoke, um, I believe it was in the spring. Hello. So I invite you to go back and look at that conversation because we are going to do our best. Conversation was a while ago, so we'll see if we can do that. But um, we are going, if you want to go back and look at it, in the past we talked about why and how you can expose kids to world religions. Hello. Hey. Um, I, I need to get my camera turned around. There. Um, there we and go. Today we're be talking about a book that she has that just came out that we've actually, we talked about it in the last conversation that we thought it would be coming out soon. It just came out. There's a giveaway going on our blog right now. I'm not sure. I think it has a few more days, like maybe till the weekend. Um, so there's still time to enter that. And that's the ABCs of World Religions. But welcome. So nice to see you again. Thank you. It's always lovely to see you, Leanna. Well, so I was just talking about how we were going to do our best not to repeat ourselves. But of course, there is going to be some overlap because you know, we want to emphasize the fact that it's so important to be talking to kids about other religions and exposing them to other systems of belief. And I want to talk in particular about your book because it's such a unique resource that, um, as we've talked about before, a lot of times there are books for kids about particular religions, but there's not much out there that really exposes them, that helps them look at all of the religions together. So I want to get into that, but, um, but first, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or kind of set, give your background a little bit more. Sure. So my name is Vicki Michaela Garlock, and um, my I'm the founder of World Religions for Kids. So this is sort of the culmination of my education and experience. Um, I have a PhD um, with dual specialties in cognitive development and neuroscience. So my dissertation was on four to eight year olds. So in theory, I'm supposed to know how kids think. Um, but then I also worked at a church, a progressive Christian church for over a decade where I developed a multi-faith curriculum. Um, and so World Religions for Kids is my bringing those two skills sets together um, to help people um, teach kids about the world's religions because I think it's very doable. I think a lot of people are nervous about it. Um, they're afraid they're going to say something wrong or pronounce something incorrectly. And so I'm here to make that easier for people. That's wonderful. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what I, what I mentioned is that there aren't that many resources that are out there that really kind of look at all the information um, the information on all the world's religions together and help kids see some of those common threads. Why is that so important? And then how do your books uh, fill that gap? Yeah, so I just, I firmly believe that religious literacy is essential um, if we want to live harmoniously and successfully in our global world. So any resources, um, any and all resources that help people learn about the world's religions are potentially valuable. But I think religions are very siloed. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is break down some of those barriers. Um, it requires knowing something about all the world's religions, which is not easy to do. And I've spent over a decade um, not just learning about the world's religions, and that is an ongoing process, but also thinking about how I can use that information and present it in a way that's kid friendly. So my idea is that um, if people can see that these religions can coexist, you know, sort of peacefully and calmly and side by side in a book, um, maybe they'll start to realize that we can do this in real life as well. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people might um, actually be surprised at all the commonalities, because usually if this is not something that you've studied and you just look at the news, all you hear about is the conflicts. But but we'll get we'll get more into that later. First, why don't we back up and you just tell us about the new book that you have that came out. Although I should mention you do have two other books. There's We All Have Sacred Spaces and also Embracing Peace, which is um, stories about peace from all the different world religions. But you have one that just came out, the ABCs yeah. of the World Religion. So tell us about that. Yeah, so that's 
this one, which is going to look, you know, a little bit backwards, but ABCs of the World Religions, um, it's like many other ABC books, right, where each letter gets a certain message or a certain theme. So in my book, I've given each letter a two-page spread. So again, for the list, of, I'll just show this one for the letter P. It has a two-page spread. So on the left-hand page, um, which is really great for the younger kids, there's a rhyming couplet. So for example, the one for P is for prayer, right? P is for prayer. It comes in all forms. Although there are guidelines, there aren't many norms. So it's just a little rhyming couplet, and that may be enough exposure to the concept of prayer for younger kids. But then on the right-hand pages, I provide additional information. And oftentimes, that information shows how the theme might appear in different religious traditions. So I have both text and images that show how prayer might show up in other religious traditions. How does it look in Islam? How does it look in Judaism? How does it look in Hinduism and Buddhism? Um, what about when people chant with beads? Is that a form of prayer? And so it just tries to expand the concept a little bit and show how these um, commonalities appear in different faith traditions, or at least get people thinking about that possibility. So what age group would you say this is for? Although it kind of sounds like it, it can be uh, enjoyed by different age groups. Yes. Yeah, so so it's really geared for kids age 4 to 10, which is what I say about all my books, although I have adults tell me that they learn a lot as well. Um, that's especially true for that book, We All Have Sacred Spaces, where most adults have never been in um, a sacred space that is not from their own tradition. So you, they've never been in a synagogue, they've never been in a mosque, and that book uses real-world um, photographs from around the world. And so I have all kinds of friends who buy that book, and I say, you know, that's really for kids who are age 4 to 10. They say, I know, but I learned so much. <laughs> I love that because that's um, something that we had kind of talked about in our last conversation that a lot of times as an adult, you're learning along with the kids as you read these books and that that's okay. Like that you don't have to be an expert in another religion in order to expose your kids and kind of give them um, that information about it. But um, one of the things that's so important, I think, about your books is that it shows how many common threads there are among religions, as we know, I mean, of course, there are a lot of differences and we don't want to gloss over that, but there are also these common threads like using altars. Um, a lot of religions have head coverings or, of course, the importance of prayer. What is so significant about having kids see those connections and how does that give them a different perspective? Well, so, yeah, I, I mean, I'll say right from the beginning that all religions are not the same. And as you point out, we don't want to gloss over those differences. But I think we do a disservice when we fail to recognize that there, if you step back just a little bit, there are some interesting commonalities. So, for example, someone can say, well, I pray five times a day wherever I am. And someone else can say, oh, I make offerings to, you know, the deities on my altar at home. On the surface, those things seem very, very different, right? And the, and the problem when we focus on the differences is that's how we set up divides, right? That's how things become siloed and stay that way. So I think if, for me, trying to break down these boundaries, um, what we need to do is step back a little bit and see, you know, if you actually look at this as all of these people or both sets of these people are trying to find a way to access the divine presence or perhaps the divine spark within themselves, then all of a sudden we don't just focus on the uh, focus on the differences. We can actually begin to see, oh yeah, I see how these things are not so different sometimes after all. And 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 as we've talked about before, this is actually this isn't just an abstract um, idea. Wouldn't it be nice if we understood each other better? But it has real world consequences that are kind of urgent problems for a lot of kids because a lot of kids will be bullied because of they belong to different um, a different religions or they're perceived as being so different. And what's interesting though that I know you have mentioned is that a lot of times when we're talking about differences and we're talking about diversity, we're much more comfortable talking about other aspects of culture and um, other kinds of differences, but we usually are very nervous to talk about religion. 
why do you think that is and but why is it so important that we do that if we're creating a more inclusive society why does religion have to be a key component of that yeah 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 well let me back up and, and talk a little bit more about the bullying thing so so I think that yes, the real world consequences are that there's research to show that, you know, if young women, girls in middle school and high school wear hijab, they're much more likely to get bullied, to have someone pull, try to pull their hijab off. Um, we see the same thing in the sick community um, for those who wear turbans, right? So those are real world consequences related to sort of bullying and, and how our kids are moving through the world. Um, but the other thing that I um, like to point out is that even if it's not about bullying, it's also kind of about knowing your neighbor, right? So we all live in these neighborhoods. We shop at the supermarket, the local supermarket. And so in addition to sort of the bullying aspect, I think there's just this idea that, you know, we don't want to have barriers between um, ourselves and our neighbors and we want to know our neighbors. So I think that's an important, and, and in some ways that's even more pervasive this idea that we don't talk to people or we don't interact with people because we're afraid we're gonna say something wrong I think if we if we um, knew a little bit more about others people's faith traditions we would be a little bit more um, likely to interact um, back to your question though I think you know if we talk about intersectionalities religious affiliation is an important piece of how people um, self-identify um, and how people define themselves. And so I see religion um, as kind of the next frontier, right? It's taken years and years, decades really, some might argue centuries, for educators and caregivers to realize that we need to talk to kids about race, ethnicity, and culture, and we're very slowly getting better and better at that, right? So I see religion as kind of the next step. Um, people used to be afraid um, to talk about race and culture with kids or they didn't know how to do it or there weren't any resources for that. And so I really see religion as sort of the next step because it is an important part of how people identify. We read a lot in the news right now about um, how Western Europe and Canada and the U.S. is becoming more secular. Young people aren't going to church. They call them the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. But the truth of the matter is the research shows that 85% of people in the world do identify with a religion. So if people are sitting around hoping that religion is just going to go away, that's not going to happen anytime soon. That's a really good point. And I think you had also mentioned before, if you're, uh, even if in the past there were maybe parts of the country or little towns that weren't very diverse, uh, that's really not the case anymore. And then almost everywhere you go, you're going to find religious diversity and, um, and maybe in ways that weren't there even 20 or 30 years ago. And so, like you say, if we're creating these communities and getting to know our neighbors, that is a really important aspect of that. Uh, but like you say, it's interesting that that's one that, that often gets missed or gets skipped over. And it's so important. I know we just had the, um, the anniversary of 9-11. And we all know what happened afterwards with all of the um, kind of the vitriol that was directed towards Muslims or Sikhs who are often thought to be Muslims. Yeah. And so having this understanding and having our community come around uh, together around these issues is so important. Um, and you have spent a lot, a long time educating kids about world religions and I'm just curious how do they respond like I know you said you created this curriculum you have these books what are the reactions and then what are some of the questions you get or what are some of the biggest misunderstandings that they come um, they come to this material with yeah well it's kind of funny because I always tell people oh kids are way easier than grown-ups <laughs> So, you know, if it's grown ups tend to have a lot more hang ups, um, um, and there's good reason for that sometimes. But um, let's go. I mean, we'll go back to the prayer example since I guess that's one of the examples we're using today. Um, if you tell kids, oh, you know, some people, you know, pray by bowing down on a mat, some people wear a shawl when they pray, some people kneel down in a church and put their hands together when they pray, some people count on beads and chant. Um, some people, um, you know, pray to deities in the morning. Oh, these are prayer flags. Oh, these are prayer wheels. You know what kids say to all of that? They're like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> it's all it's all fine, right? Um, adults tend to analyze stuff, which there's nothing wrong with, but it's really easy to get yourself tied up in knots pretty quickly. So, you know, adults are more likely to say, well, now, wait a minute. If someone is, like, chanting with beads, is that really prayer? If someone is, like, dancing or creating art, is that really prayer? And so, you know, kids, in that sense, kids are, are a lot um, easier to work with, right? And they're, they tend to be very enthusiastic. Enthusiastic, um, and they have a lot to say about this stuff. Not all kids agree, um, and so and so. Yeah, I would say kids are easier, but I think that might be also sort of a generational thing. I think we're seeing the same thing with, for example, um, kids who are mixed race or use different pronouns. Right? Um, the older generations are like, well, wait a minute. What if some is mixed race. Well, wait a minute. What if they're using two different types of pronouns? And the younger generation is just like, yeah, it's all good. It's all fine. We got it. Yeah, it, it, so. it seems to be much more intuitive to them. That, that's, a, that's a great parallel to make because I, that's something I've definitely noticed with my kids and their friends. That this is this is just not a none of this is really a big deal to them. Whereas for adults, it's, we have a hard time getting wrapping our heads around it and i just want to say the comment says thank you these are like our messages too we bring awareness to the golden rule as a tool for peace wonderful thank you for the work that you're doing and um <clears throat> this is so important to talk to kids about this because it has as we mentioned consequences on the playground for bullying but also on the larger scale as far as peace you know if we could <clears throat> if we could bring this kind of message about finding the common threads and um and this kind of intuitive sense that kids have is like, yeah, these, they, they're easy. It's easy for them to see what the commonalities are. Um, what are, are there any kind of misconceptions that they have or things that surprise them when you talk about, when you talk about these ideas? Yeah, I think, um, I wouldn't say that kids are surprised per se. I do think they enjoy the opportunity to talk about this stuff. You know, one of the things that people ask me is, well, you know, if I teach kids about the other religions, won't they be confused? Right. And then when I ask them and I say, well, you know, confused about what? They say, well, something like, well, confused about God. <laughs> and my response is, God is really confusing. <laughs> um, and, so, and so if we're trying to prevent confusion, um, by keeping kids ignorant, I personally, as an educator, don't think that's the right, the right approach. And so, again, with adults, I think the things that adults find, I think there's two things that adults find surprising, more so than kids. One of the things that adults find surprising is how accessible this information actually is. Right. So, you know, people think, oh, I need to know something. I need to take a course in world religions um, and understanding God or the divine presence or the deities or whatever you want to call that is confusing. But it's very easy to understand things like what holy days do people celebrate? What kind of clothing do people wear or not wear? What kind of things, foods do people eat or not eat? That is very accessible. And I think adults are often surprised at how accessible it really is. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think that doesn't surprise kids, but sometimes surprises adults, is how much they have to say. If you ask them about God or angels or or things that are unseen, they have a lot of ideas about that stuff. So I would say it's usually the adults that are more surprised than the kids. I think the kids kind of go at this like, oh, yeah, cool. We're talking about something that, you know, we never get to talk about. Right. That's so interesting. I, I love that. I, I love that kids, are, excuse me, are so <clears throat> are so open to talking about this. And again, I think adults get so nervous. So that's that's neat to hear that if we just give them the space to talk about it, they're very excited to do so. And I was curious for you, because you have spent so much time in this space, you think about this so much, you've created all these materials, and we've talked about how one of the big questions that all religions are trying to, to answer is how to live in this world. What is the mean, What does it mean to live in this world and what should we be doing? So after all your years of study, how has that influenced you? Like, what are some of the universal truths or the ideas that you have gotten out of doing this kind of interfaith work? So for me sorry, personally, sorry, that's too personal. No, it's okay. For for me personally, 
um, you know, almost every day as I, I'm because I'm moving through the world too, right? I'm trying to figure out how to get along with people in different spaces. Um, and so almost every day I I literally use knowledge that I've gained from one world tradition or another. So for example, someone was trying to um get me to call one someone was trying to get me to call a meeting, right? And they wanted me to do it the next day. But the next day wasn't a good time to talk to the person about setting up this meeting, right? So I waited a couple of days and then they they said to me, Oh, I can't believe Vicky didn't get in touch with you already. She said she was gonna get in touch with you. And um, I told the person, I said, you know, the Buddha says that part of quote unquote right speech is thinking about the timing of your speech, right? So all the time I get little lessons um, that help me navigate in the real world. And I hope that, um, you know, my children who grew up in sort of a multi-faith household um, access that as well or are able to access that as well. And, you know, eventually I hope people who read my books and know about my work will be able to, to access that knowledge because I think the different traditions have things to share and have things to tell us um, if we can take a moment to listen. Well, that is a wonderful note to end on. And maybe you could also tell us if people want to access these materials, like um, like your books and so on, how can they do that? In addition to, as I mentioned, we do have a giveaway going on on Multicultural Kid Blogs right now, which I believe goes through Saturday or Sunday, which would be what? Yeah, Thursday. it may even go through Monday. Um, but yeah, so I have three books, right? We all have Sacred Spaces, which is the one that has real world photographs. I have this one, Embracing Peace which is peace stories from a variety, eight different religious traditions. They all have peace stories that I can share with kids. And then back to ABCs of the World Religions. So the giveaway is whoever wins, I will send one copy of all three books. Um, of course, they're available on Amazon. And um, I'm on all the usual social media outlets. I'm on Instagram, Twitter X, um, Facebook. I'm also on TikTok. Um, my handle on TikTok is at learn religions um and my hashtag is religion minute so my goal on TikTok is to teach grown-ups about the world's religions one minute at a time which i love those i mean i'm not on TikTok, but i know you often share those on instagram as well yeah and there's so, there's such a great way just to get that little bit of information like you said that um it's only a minute long but they're there as we mentioned your your information is so accurate that this is a really reliable source because that can be a question too you know people if you're studying different religion how do you know what's a reliable source and you are a very reliable source <laughs> really wonderful thank so you I i've spent a lot of time working on it so i am i'm glad i hope so <laughs> well thank you everybody for joining us this will be up on our instagram page in just a minute if you joined late and you want to uh, watch the whole thing and then later up on our youtube channel thank you so much it's always a great to thank talk you. with you Bye. you too take care Thanks. Bye-bye.